A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. I preach to you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do sit, please. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The King James Version says, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John's Gospel, chapter 13 and verse 35. That was Jesus' command to his disciples back then and his command to us who, who seek to live for him now, what Archbishop Curry calls the way of love. To let love be the guiding principle, the compass, if you like, in our lives. Now, the Gospels do not tell us whether the disciples found this command easy to comply with and to follow, but we know what a burden it places on us who try to live by this love principle. And why? Because of the stipulations that Jesus places upon us. Here's what he says. Here's what we must do. We have to love our neighbors as ourselves. We've got to love our enemies. Who wants to do that? We've got to love those who hate us and despise us because of the way we live. Maybe because of the way we look. Maybe because of the color of our skin. And here's the kicker. We have to be prepared, we have to be prepared to love unconditionally and sacrificially. 
Now that is difficult to do. So much easier, so much easier to sing about love and, and in my case, preach about love rather than live a life of love. But yes, we are sentimental beings, even as Christians, so, so what, what do we do? We give gifts to demonstrate our love to those of our family members, those who are part of our social circle. A lot of that is happening today. Brethren, that's not what Jesus asks of us. Hear what he says in his gospel. If you love those who love you, if you give to those who will return the favor, you haven't done anything, he says. Non-believers, Gentiles, they do that all the time. But what we are doing today, being Valentine's Day, perhaps reflects a little bit on what Jesus is trying to say to us. Today is a day of lovers and for lovers, and I trust that the men of our church, for their own sakes, remember that. Remember to buy their gifts, this is no laughing matter, and cards, and whatever else. I promise you, brothers, that you'll hear about it for a long time to come. For us believers, Jesus says, the way of love has to be a lived experience. By this shall everyone, all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not only for your family or that special person in your life, you know, who we would want to go out and buy chocolates for, or, or lingerie, could I say that in church? Or, or a piece of jewelry, but all whom we encounter. Jesus says, practice that kind of love that forces you, forces you to go beyond merely willing to offer gifts and share sentiments as wonderful as those are. What it means to love as Jesus summons us to do every day is to go beyond the expected. Paul the Apostle sought to help the believers in the first century to understand what love must mean for them. Now here's what he said to the brethren at Rome. Let your love be genuine. Genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing and sharing love. No doubt, weighing heavily on his mind was what Jesus himself had said. Love the stranger. Love that person in your midst whom you struggle with to love. The unlovable. Love the despicable those who make it their business to annoy you and work on your last nerve. Yes, love those two. Listen to what the writer of the first epistle of John said to the believers in the first century. It's good to read your Bibles. Let us not love in word or speech, that's easy to do. But in deed and in truth, let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. Has this ever happened to you? You come across someone who makes you furious, and as you try to reprimand them or remonstrate with them, they look at you in the eye and say, love you. 
aggravating. But Jesus says, love them too. What can love truly do for our lives? Oh, it can help us to look beyond the fault of others. You know, in the old days, you used to say, be careful when you point your finger at somebody, look what the thumb is doing. We got to be able to look beyond the fault of others. We got to find it possible in our hearts always to afford forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Love can bring families together, I believe. Families that need healing. Love can bring communities together, I believe, that are broken. Love can help rifts that develop even in churches. And I believe, and maybe naively so, that the love that Jesus challenges us to practice in our lives will help us to effect reconciliation among us right here in Tallahassee right now despite what we are living through despite what we experience every day for such is the power of love yesterday the Union of Black Episcopalians right across our country took the time to thank God for sharing with us Absalom Jones. And for those of us who are unfamiliar with his name, well, he was the first African American to be ordained in the Episcopal Church a long time ago. And Absalom's story is remarkable. He was born into slavery at a time here in America when some thinkers, not always Christians, debated whether enslaving another human being was dehumanizing. We would say today, duh. They debated whether it was immoral. They debated whether it was wrong in the sight of the Creator God. But you know what? A lot of church leaders avoided that debate because they held slaves themselves. So it would have been hypocritical to get in on that debate, to get up and preach about the evils of slavery. Some even had the temerity, the temerity to debate whether slaves had souls. So the kind of inhuman treatment they meted out to those whom they owned, well, they were just property anyway. I believe that those churches in our time who have seriously considered reparations as we have done in some parts of the Episcopal Church, have found that to be redemptive. It's given us the opportunity to atone for all the sinful forms of exploitation that we were a part of. Well, Absalom was born into that kind of world. And the record shows that he taught himself to read using the New Testament as one of his preferred resources. We're also told that at age 16, he was sold, separated from his family to a shopkeeper in Philadelphia. It was a mixed blessing. For despite living in bondage, he was able to attend a night school for slaves. And that school was operated by the Quaker Society. Absalom was wise beyond his years. Guess what he did? He saved whatever monies he earned for doing extra chores. 
all with an eye on the future. So that when the opportunity came, when it presented itself, he was able to buy the woman that he loved out of slavery. Bought her freedom first. And here is why that was clever. Because he looked to the future and he realized that the children born of their union would be free. So upon securing his own freedom in 1784, long time ago, Absalom was able to serve as a lay minister for the black membership at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church. Absalom could read. Absalom could preach. Absalom could teach. And therefore, he was able to persuade many. And so on account of his active evangelism, he brought many to Jesus, even though they were not free. That was Absalom's way of preparing them for the time when they would be free. That's how he understood the whole question of, of freedom as found in Jesus. Though you're, you're in chains, your soul is free. And we know that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We know that they're free from the burden of their sins. We know that they're able to live lives, fulfill lives. And he was joined by his great friend, Richard Allen, and in their endeavor, and because of their efforts, the membership at St. George's grew. However, however, that pleased God, we know, but not the racists who were in that congregation. And so alarmed by the growing numbers of black congregants, the vestry decided to segregate the church choosing to have the white parishioners sit in the nave, like where you're sitting now, whilst they banished the black parishioners to the balcony. This greatly troubled Absalom and Richard. And so one Sunday morning, as the church gathered for worship, Absalom and Richard led the black congregants out of that church, singing as they made their way out. And no amount of coaxing and explaining and encouraging could cause them to return. Instead, they went off and established what was then called the Free African Society that offered counsel and spiritual guidance to those who followed them. Through that society, Absalom and Richard accomplished a whole lot. Well, they started off by offering support to widows and orphans and the poor. See the gospel there? They took to heart what the first epistle of John suggested. Let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. They willed into being what was called at the time a benevolent society to see after the needs of others. And the record shows that in 1794, James and Allen, with the assistance of the Quakers and some Episcopalians, established the first African church in Philadelphia. And soon, soon they applied to become part of the Episcopal Church. Richard Allen 
decided that he didn't want to be an Episcopalian. So he went off and formed what we call today the AME Church. Now, Absalom came to the Episcopal Church with a plan in mind. He said to the serving bishop at the time, we want to become part of the Episcopal Church. However, however, we've got three conditions for you. He was like an Episcopalian before the time. We have three conditions for you. One, that you receive us as a body. You accepting everyone we bring with us. But why? Because they wanted to maintain their identity. Two, they wanted to exercise and maintain control over their affairs. The diocese was not going to tell them what to do. And three, that Absalom be licensed as a lay reader until such time as the church decided that he was ready for ordination. And somehow, somehow the diocese agreed. And in 1795, Absalom was ordained a deacon, the first African-American to be ordained in the Episcopal Church. It took a number of years before they ordained him priest. It didn't matter because Absalom understood what his ministry was about. He was more than just dressing up as a clergyman with collar and whatnot. No, it had to do with the love he was prepared to show always. And that caused him to spend his time teaching others to read, for he recognized that if you're able to read, you can reason. And if you're able to reason, no one can take advantage of you. Absalom did not stop there. Soon he began to advocate for the freedom of slaves in the country. What a man. In 1800, he petitioned Congress to bring to an end the slave trade and to provide for the gradual emancipation of all of his black brethren who remained in servitude. He recognized the importance of good health. And so he worked with Richard Allen and others to combat the yellow fever epidemic that was raging across Philadelphia. He assisted with the training of nurses. He had to secure facilities where the sick could be kept. Absalom did not stop there. He introduced his fellow believers to the importance of creating small businesses. Talk about creative thinking. Pointing out that that vehicle could lift people out of poverty. Friends, Absalom used God's call upon his life to make better the lives of others. So as we thank God today for this remarkable man of faith, we Episcopalians must take to heart not only Absalom's example, but remember what guided him. The words of Jesus. That he sought to live out every day of his own life. By this shall everyone know you are my disciples if you have love, if you have love for one another.